Um, so we were talking about condensation last class, right? And uh, we went through some equations. Um, if I remember correctly, we went. This was the last one that can be used for both a sphere and a tube uh, for the heat transfer coefficient of, of a pure uh, saturated vapor condensing either on a sphere or on an horizontal tube. And we said that today we are going to talk a little bit about banks. Um, and we already revised a little bit of banks, uh, what is a bank, especially in external convection. And we said that it's a 2D arrangement of tubes. So these are um, horizontal tubes that stack on top of each other, like shown in this figure. And this kind of setup is commonly used in condenser design. Um, However, uh, in this kind of design, it should be important for you to note that the average thickness of the liquid film at the lower tubes is much larger as a result of the condensate falling, right, falling from the top of the tube directly above. And this is going to impact the average heat transfer coefficient, since it's going to be lower um, uh, at the lower tubes in such arrangements. And we are going to see how it impacts the heat transfer coefficient in these tubes. Again, why? Because the condensate is falling from the top of the tubes, right? So you expect a much um, uh, larger condensate film here in these lower tubes, and that for sure is going to impact the average heat transfer coefficient. So uh, you have this equation in your textbook for condensation occurring in n horizontal number of tubes. Uh, arrange it such as the sheet uh, from one tube flows directly onto the tube below. And it says to refer to figure 920 in your eighth edition. So this is the figure, is similar to the figure I show you, um, where the condensate right is falling uh, from the top of the, uh, of the first row of the tubes, right? Um, so here, the average heat transfer coefficient for this system of tubes is estimated by replacing the tube diameter by dn. So diameter times the number of tubes you have in the bank, right? Where n is the number of horizontal tubes. And um, this, it says that this method is a general yields conservative result because condensate does not fall in a small, smooth sheets from one row to the other, but drips from one tube to the other. So. Uh, it's a conservative approach because it is not falling like very nicely in films, right? But it's dropping like a small, a small, um, small amounts of the fluid. So then um, Chen, uh, that was the person that developed the convective heat transfer coefficient equation for this case of horizontal tubes, suggests that since the thin film is subcalled, additional condensation occurs on the liquid layer between the tubes. Assuming that all the subcalling is used for additional condensation, then we have this H, H equation or equation to approximate the convective heat transfer coefficient. As you can see, we have to read again many properties from tables. And there's a new variable here that we haven't checked before. That is the Jacob number, okay, that is JA. So uh, the Jacob number was previously defined uh, as this um, quantity here, and well, is named uh, after the German heat transfer researcher Max Jacob, who did pioneer job on phase change phenomena. And physically, what it represents, the Jacob is the ratio of the maximum sensible heat absorbed by the liquid to the latent heat of the liquid. So when the Jacob is small, the latent heat of absorption dominates and the correction factor can be neglected. And so it is reasonable to use this, um, this uh, equation that provides good agreement with experimental results provided that N minus one multiplied by the Jacob is less than two. Okay, um, so in order to check what are all these variables here, row L, row V, H, F, G, T, S, V, T, S, your textbook at the end of the chapter provides this nomenclature, okay? So it says in all preceding equations, the, the, all the different variables, okay? And also um, 
units are listed here. So it's at the very end of the chapter where you have all the variables and the nomenclature employed through all the chapters. So you have there what is the CP, CPL, K, row L, row B, G, HFG. So you have all the variables here defined, okay? So it's a very useful page. Uh, that if you want to mark because all the uh, preceding equations have uh, the this nomenclature. Another important thing that you need to check from these equations in this chapter, especially the, the equation for the bank tubes that we just saw, the 924, uh, so it was 924, the chain equation. Uh, all of those equations from 917 to 924 should be evaluated at an effective film temperature, okay? So not just film temperature, but an effective film temperature. So we have a new definition of the film temperature for these equations, guys. And is TS plus 0.25 TSB minus TS. So this will be our new effective film temperature, especially for the Chen equation that we just checked for um, tube, tube banks or condensers. And we are going to use this equation in an example so you can see how it changed our new effective film temperature. So let's solve um, then a tube bank or condensation of steam on tubes. And we have 0 0.013 meter outer diameter, 1.5 meter long tube is to be used to condense steam at 40 K Newton per meter square. Uh, the temperature of saturation of the vapor is 3.49 Kelvin on its outer surface. Estimate the heat transfer coefficient for this tube in the horizontal position and the vertical position. Assume the average tube wall is 3.25 Kelvin. So we want to know the heat transfer coefficient, how it's changed with position, horizontal or vertical. Okay, for these uh, tubes. Um, so we have um, here all the data again. And uh, in this case, we are going to use the, uh, the new film temperature equation, right? That in this case is T surface plus 0.25 TSB minus T surface. Um, so this is the equation here with numbers that is give us a new uh, average temperature of the condensate film of 331 Kelvin. So we are going to read the properties in table 13, appendix two, uh, that we need to get the heat transfer coefficient for both cases. So we need to interpolate, okay? Uh, because remember most of the equations in this chapter uh, said that to have a good approximation is better to have the interpolated properties. And uh, this is example 9.4 in page 608 in your eighth edition, if you want to follow the example there. So in this case, uh, we need uh, to use our equation uh, for the tube in horizontal position, equation 9.3. Uh, we need to get the modified latent heat of vaporization. So the modified heat, uh, heat latent heat of vaporization is FAG plus 3 eighths of CPL TSB minus TS. So we have our modified latent heat of vaporization that is 2.4 10 to the 6 because we need it here, right, in the HC equation, equation 9.23 for a horizontal uh, tube. Um, remember that in this equation, we have a C constant or um, C value that changes depending on the geometry, right? Is the question that we were discussing about if we can use for a tube or for a sphere. So C is 0.725, right? And um, so 7.25 here, and uh, we input all the numbers required for equation 9.23 that we revised previously. And we have that for a horizontal tube, the H value or the heat transfer coefficient is around 10,000. Uh, now we want to evaluate what happened in vertical position. So we can, so we can treat it, this kind of um, geometry as a vertical plate that has an effective length of L. So then we apply equation 
So again, we have all the properties here. We already calculate the modified latent heat of vaporization previously, and we have a value of around 4, 4 K uh, of the convective heat transfer coefficient. So as expected, the horizontal orientation yield heat transfer coefficient 2.5 times the vertical. Um, so a few notes on film condensation inside horizontal tubes. Um, well, most condensation pro processes encountering refrigeration and air conditioning applications involve condensation on the inner surfaces of horizontal or vertical tubes. The transfer analysis of condensation inside tubes is complicated by the fact that it's strongly influenced by the vapor velocity and the rate of liquid accumulation on the walls of the tube. So we need to use more complicated equations than whatever we have seen so far for film condensation inside tubes. Um, you should not forget that boiling coefficients are normally much higher than single phase coefficients. That is what we have seen so far with the equations and the problems we have reviewed. So boiling coefficients are much higher than single phase coefficients. The delta T across the film will dictate whatever you get nucleate or film boiling. And it's something that we revise in a problem, right? Remember when we move the delta T excess, we can change into different areas of our boiling curve, right? So the delta T across the film is going to dictate whether you get nucleate or film boiling. And knowing that delta T excess, you can locate yourself in the boiling curve, right? And check in which regime you are working on. So don't forget this. Also, if you have condensing vapor, the presence of a non-condensable gas can lower the convective heat transfer coefficient significantly. And hand correlations to account for this effect are limited. Okay, so they are limited, but maybe you can have a good approximation out of them. It's something that you should not forget, okay? Uh, so again, these are uh, important things you should not forget during your design course, okay, especially when revising boiling service. And um, regarding how can, can calculations to account for um, for this later, later case, um, remember that all the equations for convective heat transfer coefficients are are typically developed in a lab, right? A scientist, a researcher go to the lab, set up, set up an experiment with a certain fluid, a certain geometry, right? And that's how he approximates all the age and all the nozzle correlations we have seen so far, right? So there are new correlations out there. People keep, keep uh, researching on this. So you might need to do investigations uh, when you reach that course to look for more accurate geometries for your for your particular process that you are evaluating. Because imagine you came with a new, for example, you came with a new um, design for a heat exchanger or for a condenser. Well, if it is your new design, you might need to get your own age equation that applies to your new design because maybe the ones that are available won't give you an exact value, right? of the convective heat transfer coefficient. That's why we have so many equations in your textbook. So it's something that you need to have in mind, um, especially when dealing with your um, design course in later semesters. So let's start our problem session number one. So we have a sheet of moist recycled paper in a paper recycling plant that travels between two rollers that impart a velocity of 0.6 meters per second to the paper sheet as it dries. The temperatures of the paper and the ambient air at 25 Celsius and 50 Celsius respectively. And the length of the paper between the rolls is eight meters. If a frictional shear force of 0.06 newtons acts on the paper, what is the convective heat transfer from the air to the paper? Take the width of the paper to be one meter. The properties of the air at the film temperature, and this is something I'm going to do in the exam. I'm going to provide you the properties at the film temperature so you don't have to interpolate. Density, CP, and the prance. So you don't have to read properties. You just need to solve the problem. 
you are provided the shear force, right? The shear force is given in this problem. So remember that we have a correlation that help us to solve problems when we have friction factors or shear force given, right? And we have two different correlations, the Reynolds, right? And the Chilton carbon analogies that we revise very early when we start talking about convection, right? And the Reynolds analogy, we use it when our plants equals one. And we use a Chilton carbon analogy when our plant it was different from one. Right? So maybe it is a Chilton carbon analogy that helps us to solve this convection problem because we are given the shear force. That's a big hint in this problem. We are giving the shear force, frictional forces uh, become important. And when we know frictional forces, shear force, and convection is involved because we have a fluid moving, right? Uh, then might be pointing out. Uh, to either um, Reynolds analogy or Chilton carbon analogy. Okay, so we have some data given, right? We have the width of the paper, the length of the paper, the shear force, the free stream velocity, the wall temperature, and the free stream temperature. So first step, I'm going to calculate my field temperature and get the properties uh, interpolated at that temperature, but you already have that, so you don't have to worry about that. So film temperature properties at the film temperature for the air. I'm going to get the area of my paper. That is going to be the width of my paper times the length of my paper. So one times eight is eight meter square. That would be my area. I can now, know in that area, the shear stress. And from the shear stress, I can get the friction coefficient that allows me to use the Chilton Corborn analogy. Why the Chilton Corborn analogy? Because the Reynolds analogy is valid for plants equals one. And uh, the Chilton Corborn is allowed for plants different than one, right? It has a more wide range of the plants. So I'm going to get my shear stress, that is force, uh, my shear force given divided by the area, right? That's shear stress. And um, I get 0 0.0075 Newton per meter square or Pascals. Then I can get my uh, friction coefficient from the shear stress, right? And we solve a similar problem like this in class. It was the building problem. Uh, so I get a friction coefficient of 0 0.037. And that was perhaps the most complicated part of the problem because I know the friction coefficient, so I just can directly apply my Chilton Corbon analogy. Okay. Um, so if you want to apply just the analogy from this point, I did the complicated part for you. So um, now just apply the analogy, uh, the Chilton Corbon, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, get the convective heat transfer coefficient. Once you have the convective heat transfer coefficient, use Newton's cooling law to get the heat transfer rate. So this is the chilton carbon analogy, right? This one. If it is just the Reynolds analogy, the brand becomes one and it's just the friction coefficient divided by two equals the Stanton. And the Stanton number is the one that contains the convective heat transfer coefficient. That's why we can uh, mix these two equations and just get the H out of it. So the Stanton definition is convective heat transfer coefficient divided by density, free stream velocity, heat capacity. So I don't know my H, right? So I know the density because I got it from properties. I know the free stream velocity and I know the CP. So I can get that my Stanton equals convective heat transfer coefficient times this constant, right? Knowing the Stanton, uh, we can just put in the chilton Colburn analogy, right? And uh, we can get the H out of it. We know the friction coefficient. Uh, we, uh, this is just the constant we calculate here in the denominator from the Stanton, multiply it by the plant that we read at the film properties to the two thirds. So that gives me an H or convective heat transfer coefficient of 15.8 watt meter square per Kelvin. 
Once we know that, we just put in Newton's cooling law to get a heat transfer rate of around 3,175 um, watts. So how we know we, we, ha we can use Chilton Colburn analogy to solve this problem? First of all, we are given the shear force. From the shear force, we can get the friction coefficient. When ed whenever a problem related to uh, convection gives you these shear stress forces uh, or shear coefficient or friction coefficient, you can use either the, the, the Chilton Corbon or the um, Reynolds analogy. So what if, what if instead of using the Chilton Colburn analogy, you use the Reynolds analogy? So I did the problem using the Reynolds analogy without the brand, the brand correction. And if you can see, the heat transfer coefficient change a little bit if you disregard the prance. So the prance gives you this fine result, okay? Um, for example, without considering the prance, right, without the correction from the prance and just saying, okay, my prance number is near to one, so I'm going to use just the Reynolds analogy, you get a heat transfer rate of 20, 2,500 more or less versus the 3,000, so it's like 600 more or less difference uh, watts. So as you can see, the input of the prank gives you a much better approximation in this case than just doing the rough approximation of the prank equals one and using the Reynolds analogy. So I just did this part to show you that, okay? So as you can see, the prank is so important. The prank gives you that uh, pretty nice approximation result. For this one, you have a already well-developed method and a step-by-step -step of how to do. So it's um, in line, in line to bank, and you have the figure there, and it carries saturated water vapor that maintains the tube wall temperature of 120 Celsius, atmospheric air at 30, 35 Celsius approaches the tube about velocity of six meters per second, like you can see here in the figure. If the length of the tube is 0.8 meters, find the total convective heat transfer from the bank. The properties at the air uh, inlet are density, CP, viscosity, thermal conductivity, prand, and prand wall. So you have everything, guys, to solve this uh, tube bank. And tube banks are very important, especially because we will carry this knowledge for heat exchangers. So this is a very long problem. Um, so I calculate a U max of 11.53 meters per second. And with that velocity, I get a Reynolds of 8.7 10 to the three, or 8,707.36. Um, my ST over SL or transversal versus longitudinal pitch equals one. Um, so for inline, ST over SL bigger or equal than 0.7 and Reynolds between 1000 and 210 to the five, that is where my Reynolds falls. Um, I will use this equation from table 6.6. .6. Uh, this is based on the ratio of the transversal and longitudinal pitches and the Reynolds. Uh, the constant uh, also from that table is C.27 M equals 0.63 N equals zero. So I get the nozzles out of this equation, just rearranging the equation and putting numbers. Uh, I get a nozzle of 72.78. Uh, then uh, with the nozzle, the thermal conductivity and the diameter, I get an H value or convective heat transfer coefficient of 1.59.51 watt meter square. Um, so I have a less than 10 rows, so I need a correction factor. A correction factor that I need to read from tables. So I have 1459.51, the H value that I get here times the correction factor gives me 149. So I correct from there. Uh, some people correct until you calculate the total heat transfer rate. That's the same thing. 
uh, you just be multiplying by these constants. So, um, I need to calculate uh, TS uh, to get then later the delta T log mean, uh, because it's what I really need for um, getting the heat transfer rate through the bank, right? We don't, you cannot just average. Um, so TS um, is given by this equation that we check in during in important equations about two banks where N is the total number of tubes and NT is the number of tubes in any given row. Um, so by putting numbers to this equation, I got 70.05 Celsius. So I can get T naught or the fluid uh, outlet temperature. And knowing the outlet, I have given the fluid inlet the fluid surface, so I can get delta T logarithm, and then I can get heat transfer rate. Uh, the correction factor, six in line, 0.94. That's the number that goes there. Again, if you have less than 10, then you need to add this correction factor. So that's where the 94 I have somewhere here comes. Yeah, the 94 here. Mm -hmm. Then we get the bulk out because we have the, or the outlet temperature, because we have the inlet temperature. But remember, we need to get the delta T log, right? Because we said that we cannot just get an average in a tube bank because so many things are happening in, inside the bank. It's a 2D arrangement. So we need to get first the T out so we can apply the delta T log. So finally, we can apply Newton's cooling law, right? It's one of the common things we do with a tube bank, right? So I get my outlet temperature out of this equation that I gave you at that time when we were evaluating uh, tube banks. This one, see? This is the equation I'm using to find the outlet temperature. So, um, since typically the tube surface and inlet fluid temperatures are known, the following relationship is typically used to find the outlet. And once you know the outlet, you use the log mean temperature difference. Why? Because you have so many things happening in the bank because it's now a 2D arrangement. It is not only one tube. So we need to get the delta T log mean temperature before applying Newton's cooling law. So these are the two equations we are using in this problem. Uh, from lecture, lecture 11 on tube banks. So this, these are the questions I'm using. Uh, this is the question I use for you, Max. So in that lecture, I have like a step by step how to solve a uh, uh, tube bank. And here in table, in this table is where you can find all the tube bundle cross flow equations and the C, M, and N uh, parameters that you need to solve those equations. Okay, so we are in this step, the step of knowing the outlet temperature. Uh, so outlet temperature, we found it, is 49.94 Celsius. And now we are ready to calculate the log mean temperature difference in the bank. Again, because we cannot just average. Uh, so we have TS is the surface temperature or the wall temperature. TI is the fluid inlet and TO is the fluid outlet that we just got from the previous equation. So we get the delta T log temperature difference through the entire bank that is 77.29. So we are ready to put in Newton's cooling law. However, you need to be careful in Newton's cooling law. It's pi DL because it's the, at the outer surface area of the tube, right? Because it's where the fluid is having contact with the and to the arrangement of tubes, but you need to multiply by N, the total number of tubes, because you don't have only one tube, right? So surface area of one tube by the L, right? Surface area of one tube, multiply by the number of tubes you have in the whole to the arrangement that are 24, times the H value, right? Uh, times uh, delta TM that we just got. 
and the age value, this is the corrected age value. So here, if you didn't correct your age value in the step I corrected, you just put here the correction factor for the heat transfer rate. It's the same thing. Some people do it at the end. Don't do it in, when solving for each. So that would be a two bank. It's a, it's, it's a highly demanding in time problem, okay? So if you see a problem like this in the exam, I won't require that you solve for everything, but I will require you at least get me the outlet temperature from the bank. So you should know that. I mean, I won't require the whole solution for a bank, but at least I will require to know that you are that you know what you are dealing with. Because again, this is a typical arrangement for a heat exchanger, right? Uh, so be sure that you revise your bank equations. If you want to put in your note sheet a step by step how to solve, like first get my maximum velocity, then my Reynolds max, then select the equation, then you, you can do that.